Guni Koran Gedel Shias is mean lama week as a goal, the Anadi Nehere in Agnes Nashanianta, a certain curry loher lock shin. Dear friends, may I say first of all what a great privilege it is to be here in this house. Uh, the, the American Irish Historical Society. I've spoken here more than, I think more than once, and I think very, very much addressing teams that are associated with the contribution uh, of Kevin Cahill and all of those who, who worked with him uh, to give us this splendid building that we have here. Uh, Kevin uh, Cahill is uh, the kind of person who doesn't seek uh, to be present at what he would regard as uh, prestigious occasions, but is one of the great Irish people that I have ever had the privilege of knowing. Uh, the Ambassador has made reference to my own interest in international affairs. From the very beginning, uh, I, Kevin, for example, uh, 14 years ago, had worked in 65 countries. And in no case was there a single one of those, a tourist resort. In <laughs> fact, when I spoke, uh, one time we worked at Auch, that there were only two refugee camps on the planet that he hadn't visited as a doctor and as an advisor. We both shared a very deep interest in Central and Latin America. And we met in strange places in parts of the Caribbean. Uh, and it, was, it has been a privilege to know him. I also want to say about the American Irish Historical Society and why it was a privilege to speak here on interpreting Irishness and again on the Irish famine. And it's something you will be interested in about this, I think, as well, as representatives of Ireland communities. In uh, the population of Ireland in, 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 in the middle of the 19th century was over 8 million, about 8.45 million. And by the time we came to 1900, it had been reduced by three million, and one million deaths, another million immigration immediately, and then another million that had been simply displaced. But in 1901, more Irish-born people uh, lived abroad than lived on the island of Ireland. That was the severity of our migration uh, uh, experience. Why, for example, would Kevin Cahill and I be interested as well in relation to Latin America? Well, the other interesting reason is, of course, is that in the 17th century, after the collapse of the, uh, the forced defeat of the Gaelic civilization, uh, many of the Irish people worked in the armies of the different empires, and then people like Bernardo Higgins and others worked uh, as Libertador and Fundador of the Republic of Chile. So we've had, our people have been going abroad for a very long time. Uh, involuntarily, some of the time, voluntarily in the, mo in, the, in the modern period. And our experience as well in something that you've heard of our native language, which is over 5,000 years old, it's Rotterdam, Knoen, Queen of Will, and Shin Moska, Hele Kurs in Elion. What I've just said is that's very closely related to the island experience. Some of our greatest poets, uh, people March and Giron, and uh, many others uh, are associated uh, with island life. It's very interesting when an islander writes poems like March and Giron, who moved from his island even to the capital city in, uh, in Ireland. He describes it rather like as a dock leaf being torn from the soil, as he does in his poem, Stitcher. I am torn from my island. I say all of this because of my own interest. Uh, when, when I met uh, uh, Tony uh, uh, from the Marshalls Islands uh, in Paris just before uh, the great meeting in 2015, and we spoke about people being driven, torn from their islands. And that is why, when we were discussing in Paris at that time, I was reading a paper on creating, at the invitation of President Hollande, on creating a conscious for climate change. There was nothing abstract, there is nothing abstract, <coughs> about people where rising sea levels threatens their very right to exist. 
where people have to move from the edges towards the raised part of their island. Others, for example, are discussing how they may in fact actually manage to migrate, and others yet again say we would prefer to disappear altogether. And I thought that I want to say one thing as President of Ireland, who is on a visit to the United Nations, and you heard me speak this morning. It is very important, I said, to speak with authenticity. Our concern for the islands can never, in fact, be switched on in Paris and switched on afterwards. And this is connected to my own view in relation to the balance of power and influence between the General Assembly and the Security Council. I have said that the moral instincts of the General Assembly must never be defeated by the powerful, the strush of the powerful in the Security Council. And that is terribly important. If we speak of the importance of the United Nations, its enemies sometimes say it is a talking shop. But I remember a time when I spoke to different people who came to the United Nations and uh, I read biographies of those African leaders who came to the United Nations and who came to meetings in Canada and elsewhere and they say they had hopes of a new world order coming to being, including a new international economic order that would deal with issues of aid and trade and debt, including odious debt and so forth. And they describe afterwards, like Julius Nareira in his description of, I think, in his both different biographies of him, about he wept on the way home because he said they don't mean what they say. And that's very important that people be called to count about meaning, meaning what they say. And that is why it's very, very important that your views are not ones simply that were recognized for a brief period of time or, for example, that are allowed as gestures of a moral kind at the General Assembly, but must make their way into the Security Council where decisions are taken. The United Nations has no future if there is a rift between the General Assembly's moral intentions and the Security Council's outcomes. This doesn't mean it can be changed overnight, but the times we are living in at the present time now, it is not only that the strush of the powerful, as I put it this morning, defeats the moral instincts that are general in the General Assembly. It is what it means in relation, again, which I tried to discuss this morning, about the intelligence and the science and technology that is now available to us that would enable us to do wonderful things, being absorbed in new militaristic exercises. Because the narrow theory of interest defeats the democratic impulse of us all in a humanitarian sense is regularly being threatened. There are vested interests that stand uh, to gain from, in fact, the defeat of the democratic inclusion of the United Nations when, in fact, the Assembly's voice is being conveyed into the Security Council. I'm very pleased that our current representative is with law with the representative of Belize is a co-chair in the steering committee on the partnership for, for small island uh, for developing states. And I congratulate our ambassador uh, for that. And Wano takes it very, very seriously. I want to say uh, something that I think it is very important about the United Nations. The United Nations is a forum for shared principles and value that enable collective action. It may have its critics, and sometimes it, it does indeed fail us, sometimes badly. But it is all that we have, and it is all that is the materials, as Leonard Cohen might say, these are the bells that still can ring, and this is how the light gets in, if you like, in relation to the way we, uh, uh, way we go forward. I remember very much uh, the meetings that I had with Tony de Bruyne in Paris, and I'm discussing it, and the passion with people spoke about how none of these issues of rising sea levels and failure to respond to climate change are abstract issues for the island communities that we, that we have described. Uh, I think as well uh, what is very, very important is to uh, think. Uh, I, want, I, I was struck by something that reminded a long time ago I, I was pre preparing a, a television programme in 1992, Seven Days to Save the World. 
and we we were the Assistant General Secretary of the United Nations uh, at a conference in Rio had given permission to the Business Council for Sustainable Development to be on the platform as full participating members. Meanwhile, I met several of the islands, some of whom were here this evening, and they weren't uh, given full by Why? Because you had Denmark, France, Britain, Holland, so forth. They were the ones who were supposed to be speaking for them at the assembly in Rio. And when I wanted to hear about the island communities, I went down with the television crew to the Greenpeace boat, where we could hear about precisely what was in fact, what was at stake. Therefore, what you had at that stage is that you had the chair of the Business Council for Sustainable Development, was in fact actually the head of Nestle, and the vice chair was in fact Fiat Agnelli. Uh, and they were among the most brilliant defenders. They had decided on something. They had decided that the word sustainable had traction. Couldn't be, re couldn't be, she needed to be taken aboard. So therefore it was called the Business Council for Sustainable Development. We are in the same position in relation to why it is authenticity is terribly important. And it is very, very important uh, that we realise that words must be turned into real commitments that will be delivered through the entire system. And then again, I think as well, it's so pleased, I don't want to be too serious, but we're boring with you here this evening about what you know already. But those who are paying the price for global warming, those who are paying the price for rising sea level, are not those who are responsible for most of the things that we have to challenge. A 4.5, 4.5 billion year old planet has been placed at risk by economic models that broke a symmetry that exists uh, between uh, ecology, economy and, uh, eco and society. Talking to people of our, who have the experience of island life, what one is struck about, as I come back through the old literature, is the sense of symmetry that existed, the respect for, for the, the respect for for for, na for, mother, for mother nature. The whole question about it, and you know, in the middle of the one of the high points of Western writing is Francis Bacon writing about uh, uh, the releasing colonization, imperialism, domination into the world. And his phrase is, I lead to you, Mother Nature, in bondage for your use. And it's all there. I lead to you, Mother Nature, and her children to gouge out her secrets. And this is the enlightenment in Europe gone wrong. The idea that you can attack the ecosystem in an endless way, insatiable, and so forth. The insatiable are in one part of the planet. The people who pay the price are in another part of the planet. And that is why there has to be the acceptance of responsibility at global level if we have to turn the language of Paris into something that is meaningful. And I think that in many, many ways, do you think then, I often say to myself, that we will not have to adjust our models of the connection between economy and ecology and society. Those who say to you that you will be able to make adjustments that will achieve what was agreed in Paris are simply with respect, not convincing to me. There must be changes and it requires a strong discourse and in that discourse the people who stand to lose the most, the people who are the most vulnerable, must be given the space and they must be given the prospect of having their views been taken into account. I think we are, and this is the point, as I've said the United Nations is often criticised but 2015 was a very good year and I have paid public tribute to those who agreed and worked hard, including the Irish representative and Sir O'Donoghue and Dallas and the Kenyan representative, to achieve what has been achieved at the level of sustainable development and what was achieved in Paris and so on. But I have to express, and I will continue to do so, and that is my deep, deep concern 
at the manner in which the consciousness that we need is not being allowed to emerge. We must be able to ask, how can we have a form of life that enables us to sustain future generations. There are issues that arise. My previous president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, is correct in speaking about issues of intergenerational justice, of taking responsibility for the results of actions which cannot be reversed. I think in, uh, in ways uh, people uh, often think about it was one of the effects of, of, of communication challenge changes was that people couldn't ignore famines anymore. And the issue began, which famine would you have on television? Uh, I think there's none of this global poverty, none of this, these malnutrition are, uh, issues are inevitable. They can all be changed. But there is, let's be positive, the prospect of 193 nations combining to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development offers us the capacity to fulfil our moral obligations through future generations. More than that, it enables us to take into account once and for all the experience of each other on different parts of the planet, a shared vulnerable planet. I think what it offers us and what Paris offered us was a pathway uh, towards our world, mapping a way forward uh, towards sustainability. And the different regional agreements that came down through Paris, including your own ones that you shared in relation to the future of small developing islands and, and states and so on, are incredibly important. I think, uh, therefore, you are entitled to demand commitments on all of these issues, including commitments from countries like Ireland, and Ireland is happy to make a commitment to the community of nations uh, and in terms of a planet that must be cared for and, and, and defended. We are, and this is a great test for diplomacy, uh, we are in a dangerous moment where we have in parts and regions of the world. We are paying today a heavy price for those who would not allow diplomacy to run its full course and chose the path of war. We, it is tragic when I often look at the faces of young, bright scientists and technologists and others, and know that once again they're going to be hired in relation to the armaments industry. There are countries that who speak about, for example, the importance of peace, but yet produce armaments and sell them into continents where conflicts, in fact, are threatening the environment and threatening life and creating massive displacement. That is what is meant by authenticity. There must be the ring of truth in what we say. Otherwise, we'll be found out. And there are many, many people who don't care if they're found out. We are at the moment people debating foreign policy, who believe that the future, even for countries like Ireland, lies in an increased capacity to be able to participate in the most modern weapons when in fact the greatest contribution that Ireland has made over a long period of 60 years providing uh, people for peacekeeping missions, thousand in any one day of Irish men and women in any part of the world, is in relation to peace building, in relation to responding to, in relation to conflict. So we have that issue to sort out for ourselves. And the issue is as to whether you allow yourself to drift into the idea that the the planet is to be filled with fear, and the politics are to be ones of security defined in terms of military response, rather than security defined in terms of eliminating global poverty, eliminating the great seeds of, in, of people's dignity by not being respected, and of a complete failure to respect multilateralism and the multilateral institutions. I think it is a great privilege to be here with you all. I have said there is something that every time we lose a language, we lose, someone said, we lose a library. But equally in the same time, to lose the experience of island life. Each one of you represents, not just in yourself, but the relations you have between each other, as people who share the experience of, of island and existence. We in Ireland have had the experience of people having 
being forced involuntarily from our island. We live next to a very powerful island. We have had, in fact, actually, we're the, in close proximity to what was regarded as the most, the fastest expanding empire of the 19th century. We have to bear in mind, in many cases, that is why, when we speak to those countries of Africa and Asia and Latin America and of the oceans of the world, and I think that's important, these oceans that connect us. We understand this because we are not carrying the baggage of the colonizing instinct. We are not retaining in our minds the mind of empire as an obstruction to the mind of peace. And I think I want to say to, to our ambassador and to all those who are working in, our, in, our, in Irish foreign policy, it is a great privilege to work. It, should be a, it is a great privilege to work in, in, with the small island developing states and their, their, their representatives. And there are many things we can do together, not only saving our islands and not only succeeding in the short term, but I believe in saving the United Nations itself. Saving the United Nations as a multilateral institution where humanity can express itself in all its diversity where a symmetry can be reforged again between the ecosystem, forms of economy and forms of social life, and between the poetry and the words and the lives of people who look at the sea and interpret and know what it means to be bound together, to be bound also together by something that is infinite, something that is continually changing, something that is never static. That is the planet that survives. And the planet that is in most danger is one where the economic model cannot be tested, where it is descended and imposed on the world like a blight, where insatiability is never questioned, and where in fact actually the alternative, which is of course to create a civilization of sufficiency, where those whose basic needs can be met, and then after that people can go on and make choices in relation to diversity of consumption. But we must get back to a time at the United Nations when we will be free to think again, when there will be respect for thought, where moral instincts and the, the General Assembly will not be regarded as something that are merely rhetorical, and where those who are the most dangerous people on the planet can pose and provide threats to each other on the Security Council. We need to weld together all of the institutions and both sides of it, both the three sides, both Assembly and Security Council and Nations, to do what I have been describing together, which is to restore a respect for Mother Nature and to be able to create the capacity to be able to live respecting each other's dignity wherever we may be, however far from the waves of the sea. Mila Buiska, it's been a privilege to be with you.